Um, now today we've got a particularly exciting speaker, Jeff Seaman, all the way across the big pond from Virginia. And he's going to talk to us about putting the chemistry back into the history and philosophy of chemistry. I didn't know it had left, but he's going to tell us that it has, I think, uh, from other things. Jeff, while we're still waiting for people to pile in, uh, please tell us a bit about yourself and maybe a bit about your talk. Um, good morning and good afternoon to uh, so many of you. I see lots of names of people I know, so a special hello to you. Uh, Peter, Peter said to me a few minutes ago, could I please talk for about myself for five minutes? Normally, uh, people love to talk about themselves, but yeah. not this morning for me. I'm going to be very brief and, and not follow Peter's command. I'm sorry, Peter. Um, briefly, in, I received my PhD in 1971 in experimental chemistry from the University of California. Berkeley. And for the next 30 years or so, I continued doing all sorts of experimental wet chemistry and uh, a splash here and there, not like Henry Rizepa, but a splash here and there of computational chemistry. In 1983, as a hobby, I published my first article that included history of chemistry. And that continued as a hobby which over the years became more and more of my life until around 1999, 2005, the switch was more like 50-50. And for the last 20 years, truly, I've been doing history of chemistry and no, or very little actually, uh, but a little bit of experimental chemistry. This talk um, initiated six or eight months ago when I made the comment to Peter that a fair number of history of chemistry lectures that I heard over the past several years, not just in this form, but other forums as well, had very little chemistry. And in some cases, almost no chemistry. And Peter said, well, why don't you use that as a theme and give us a, give us a talk in six or eight months, whatever it was. So six or eight months ago, it seemed like just a dandy idea until about two weeks ago when I realized I had to put this talk together. And, and so I've gathered together a slew of examples from my past research in the history of chemistry in which data was essential. And I want to give examples of that. So let me, let me begin. What amused me, this is from 2003, Bulletin for the History of Chemistry. That's, of course, the journal published by the Division of History of Chemistry, the ACS. And you see in yellow there, part of the instructions for authors, which are no longer part of the instructions. But it said, chemical formula formulas should be kept to a minimum. So as my first example of putting chemistry back into history of chemistry, there it is from, from my own division of history of chemistry. So for each of a number of examples or case histories um, over the next uh, 45 minutes or an hour, um, uh, I'm going to give a, a, a brief uh, hint at, at the type of data that will show up. So for the first case history, uh, the issue is relying on fundamentals of chemistry, almost one's first year's chemistry texts. So a recent, well, not so recent, 2012, Hasek Chang, one of the most premier historians and philosophers of chemistry, Cambridge, published a paper, on, in fact, he's published several papers on, on acidity and basicity in chemistry. And I pull some quotes some excerpts from his December 2012 uh, paper in Philosophy of, of Science. So what, is, what are some of the things he says? He says the succession of acidity conce concepts that we witness in the history of chemistry does not constitute a straightforward progression of increasing general generality, each new concept completely encompassing the previous one. 
it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that the only good reason for the persistence of acidity concepts in chemistry through the ages, that includes up to 2012, is our desire to preserve a reflection of lasting everyday concepts in our science. And the third, there's been a plethora of conflicting theoretical definitions of acidity and the basic identity of the acidity constant has been maintained due to the daily operational meaning rather than any unifying consensus. Eric Sherry, uh, a philosopher of chemistry at UCLA and the founding and continuing editor-in-chief of Foundations of Chemistry, a wonderful journal in the philosophy of chemistry, I highly recommend it, last year published a criticism of some of Hasek Chang's publications on acidity, uh, including the, the one that I just mentioned. And, and he entitled his paper, Hasek Chang on the Nature of Acids. And Eric's paper was almost exclusively written as if it were 1935. There was in both Chang's and Sherry's papers, it's as if no chemistry happened since 1935. Data missing, that is almost 100 years of data missing. Dean Tantillo and I, uh, Dean is at UC, University of California, Davis. He and I have been collaborating on a variety of, of projects over the last four or five years. And recently, just very recently, we published a response to Chang and Sherry's publications in which we point out indeed that there is a unified theory of acids and bases, contrary to what the philosophers have been saying. And, and I won't go into detail today, you can read that paper, or in fact, read a number of textbooks, basic textbooks in chemistry, but the unifying theory in terms of, MO, the unifying concept in terms of MO theory, and a similar analysis comes from valence bond theory, is that it's a homo-lumo interaction between an unfilled lumo, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the acid and the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital of the base, those, those two molecular orbitals interact and they form two new molecular orbitals, one which is stabilized, meaning those two electrons go down in energy and an unfilled orbital up on the top, um, which is a, an antibonding orbital. So all of acid-base chemistry can be explained by that diagram. And in our paper, uh, Dean is responsible for a very complex set of graphics, but we tried to explain acid-base theory on this MO um, uni unifying concept. So this is part of that paper. And two of our conclusions. We strongly conclude that there is no reason to undervalue or fail to consider modern chemistry and in, instead adopt primitive ideas about any aspect of chemistry, including acid-base theory, which is essentially what those philosophers did. And then we added, we fully agree with Chang that science needs philosophy. He published a paper in PNAS in 2019 saying science needs philosophy. But Dean and I continued, we also believe that philosophy of science needs science, needs the data of science, and cannot operate effectively in the absence of the topic about which it expounds. Okay, second case. One of the, one of the advantages of doing history of science is you can use the science. So in this particular case, the, the case focuses on using many details in key publications with a focus on why certain chemists missed a major discovery. So in the early 1960s, chemists did not understand the mechanism of what were, what was then called no mechanism reactions. Not that they believed there was no mechanism, they just simply did not know what those mechanisms were. Today, those reactions 
uh, several are named here, plays and coke rearrangements, but it's basically all cyclic concerted reactions. We chemists today call those pericyclic reactions. Examples from the 1960s, which were inexplicable at that point, the question would be, why do two olefins photochemically dimerize to cyclobutane and not thermally do that? A similar related question would be, why, are the, why is the diels alder typically thermal to the left, that's the second line, and not photochemical? So why do two plus two gives cyclobutenes thermally? Why do two plus fours or four plus twos give um, deals all the reactions? Another example from the pre-1965 literature comes from the, the chemistry of vitamin D. Here's pre-vitamin D in the middle bottom. Why does it thermally give cyclized products where the joint, the, the uh, ring, forming bond between C9 and C10, why, is, why are those cis, either the hydrogen methyl down or up, whereas in photochemistry, they are anti. So syn thermal, photochemical anti. These are examples of the no mechanism problem. So Woodward and Hoffman published five communications in, in 1965, the first one January 1965, and they explained it all based on molecular orbital theory and what they called conservation of orbital symmetry. Far more complicated for me to discuss the details of that, but let it be said that they solved that entire void in 1965. And in 1981, uh, Roel Hoffman shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Kenichi Fukui. Uh, Woodward died in 1979. The LC would have received his second Nobel Prize for Hoffman's work with Woodward on the Woodward-Hoffman rules and Fukui's work on frontier molecular orbitals, which I'll mention in a few minutes. So in, in their first 1965 paper, Woodward and Hoffman acknowledged footnote five, Professor Osterhoff, University of Leiden, clearly deserves credit for having first put forward the suggestion that orbital symmetries might play a role in determining all of these reactions. The suggestion was described so succinctly that it has received no currency and it has not been generalized to include other cases. So Woodward Hoffman is saying that they were not the first to propose orbital symmetry. Osterhoff proposed it and was published four years earlier than Woodward Hoffman's papers. So what, what does that mean from a historical perspective? We have to go to the chemistry, have to look at the data there. In that Havinger Schlotman 1961 paper, here are photos of Asaf Havinger and Schlotman. In the middle of Havinger's paper, these were all Havinger and Asterhoff were colleagues at the University of Leiden, and Schlotman was Havinger's postdoc. No, pardon me, graduate student. In the middle of this tetrahedron publication, they wrote among, they wrote five or six different explanations for the stereochemical consequences, the no mechanism of no mechanism reactions. And the, the last one they proposed without any preference, they said, they wrote, as Osterhoff pointed out, another factor that possibly, so another factor that possibly contributes to the stereochemical difference is essentially orbital symmetry. <clears throat> why did no one pay attention to that publication? And in fact, why did Havinger and Osterhoff not follow up on it? That is to say, they could have right then written the first Woodward Hoffman publication and been on the road to a Nobel Prize. Well, there are a lot of reasons. And let's look at that data. Let's look at the underlying chemistry. On the top is an excerpt from their tetrahedron letter, pardon me, tetrahedron manuscript, 1961 manuscript, the line, the arrow in red and the lines in red at the top, I added. 
this was their summary of their data that they were trying to explain. Underneath that are the chemical structures of the compounds X, E, D, P, and so on. They did not have a scheme that looks like the structures that I've shown you here. So in addition, they did not know the chemistry correctly, meaning they didn't know that P reversibly goes to L, and they, and they thought that T goes to L when it does not. So Havinga's chemistry wasn't right, but in addition, their communication was very poor because if you were just looking at those equations in, on the top, you'd have to remember all the structures that I've drawn below. And it's, it's even when you are a steroid chemist, it's hard to remember all of that. So the communication of that data was horrible. So one reason they didn't believe Osterhoff's suggestion, Osterhoff himself didn't believe it, they got the chemistry wrong and they communicated poorly. Now, there is another person who was early involved in orbital symmetry, and I'm going to show what mattered to him were mathematical derivations. And in fact, I think of him more as a mathematician than a chemist, and that was Fukui. Fukui actually published in the middle of a very dense publication, 1964, in a book written for chemical physicists, not organic chemists, a book honoring Mulliken's uh, 65th birthday, 1964. In the middle of that article, uh, Fukui included table four, which is on the left side of this screen. And what Fukui was explaining was why the four plus two reaction occurs thermally and not photochemically, but he did it in an extraordinarily brief and almost uninterpretable fashion for organic chemists and of probably little interest to chemical physicists. That is the organic chemists were interested in that reaction, but the chemical physicists weren't. And these pluses and minuses refer to the phases of the homo and lumo orbitals, the frontier orbitals. And the picture to the right with the orbitals drawn in represent what Fukui is showing on the left. And this again is too complicated for this lecture, but the underlying data that I, that I say is necessary to understand history of chemistry requires an understanding of table four, which has to be in a way re, um, rewritten in the way I have. And as a side comment, you can see a homo lumo interaction. Those are the dashed lines there between the orbitals of the MOs. It's almost interpretable as an acid base reaction as well. W where is the mathematics that, that, that drove Fukui? Well, in addition to table four, he had a series of mathematical derivations, and I show you one of them in, at the bottom here. And I, I point out in the parentheses, there are two terms, uh, the sum of the occupied multiplied by the unoccupied orbitals and the unoccupied with the occupied. So this is a homo lumo occupied unoccupied levels, okay? I, I, had, I didn't understand that equation. And in fact, most organic chemists wouldn't. But, but I wanted to understand how Fukui got to this stage in 1964. And so I started reading the literature, his, pay, his publications. And wouldn't it, how interesting it was that I discovered publications in 1954 and 56 that had the same type of terms. Do you see the sum occupied and unoccupied right there? It's just like what he published in 64. And below in 57, he had the same kinds of terms. 
And in 59, he had it again. And 61, he had it again. And then there it is in 1964. So Fukui himself could have solved the Woodward Hoffman no mechanism problem way back in 1954 using perturbation theory. This is second order perturbation theory. <clears throat> now, um, the interpretation in the right-hand box, my drawings, you can see a, how would I say, a um, graphically the changing of the molecular orbital features black and white from psi one to psi four. Psi one is the lowest molecular orbital. It should be the most stable and plus dark to dark and white to white represents bonding and dark to white or white to dark represents anti-bonding. So you can see psi one has three bonding characteristics. Psi two has two, psi three has one and psi four has zero, more bonding, more stable. So that's going from the bottom to the top. This comes from Huckel molecular orbital theory and Huckel published that in 1931. So anybody who read the 1931 Huckel paper could have drawn the box on the right, which meant he or she could have drawn the box on the left before Fukui showed it in 1964. So anybody in that new 1931 could have done what was done in 1964. And not only 1931, but that same thing appeared in 35, 38, 39, 45, 49, this is from the literature, 1950s, 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 16, it kept on going. Over and over again, the same drawings show up, all the way even to 1964. The bottom one, number 33, is from my own professor, William G. Dalbin. He knew that chemistry in, in 1964. None of them solved the Woodward Hoffman uh, puzzle. Ah, here's some more, 1964. In fact, I should point out, item number 34 comes from Robertson Casario's textbook that I used in 1964, um, and so on. Okay, um, thanks thanks to uh, Roald Hoffman and Zoom tutorials with him, you can see, by coincidence, I took a photo from one of the tutorials. You can see he's giving me a tutorial on homo lumo interactions. Okay, my point is sometimes you run across data that's essential, but you don't know what it means. And I've been blessed by, by having tutorials, not just from, from Hoffman, but from, from many other chemists as well. Okay. What's another source of data that becomes that that can be crucial in the um, in the uh, understanding of a of a, a bit of history of chemistry? Uh, two years ago, I was invited by the editors of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences to write a perspective, a retrospective of um, Percy Julian. Percy Julian was the first black chemist member of the National Academy and the fourth um, black um, chemist to receive a PhD. So I had to learn about his life and his career and um, also about the continuing racial discrimination that he faced during his whole life. Born a grand slave of slaves um, and so on. Um, but there was one critical moment in his career that turned him from, from an unknown to a known. And that was his publication in 1935, marked in red, red font here, on the total synthesis of physostigmine. And I, and I wanted to know, how did he get into that from, from his um, quite nonlinear career? 
Um, There's not time for me to go through this, but it was very nonlinear. Uh, he went to Harvard to get a master's degree, but they wouldn't let him into the PhD program because blacks weren't teaching whites at Harvard at the time. And so he went and taught at a historically black college, um, got a, a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, went to Vienna where he got his PhD and, and so on. Um, anyhow, back to Pfizer stigma. Where did that come from? The top structure here is Pfizer stigmine. And Julian's PhD thesis with Spaeth was on alkaloid chemistry. Pfizer stigmine is an alkaloid. But it was on a, an alkaloid that looked very different from that of Pfizer stigmine. Um, cusperine um, in the middle structure, you can see it's a. Um, a, six, a, a benzene, an aromatic ring benzene attached to a piperidine ring, whereas on, on phytostigmine, it's a benzene with a five-membered ring. There's considerably different structures in chemistry, but if you go to Julian's PhD thesis available from the University of Vienna, you, you see structures uh, on the bottom, structures one and two. These are excerpts from that thesis. You can see that he was doing research on indoles, the 6-5 system, and not on the 6-6 system. And so as soon, so, so um, Julian's chemistry is a derivative from, um, from his work in his PhD. Now I want to talk about data that's not chemical data, but it's data about chemical data. Uh, together with Guillermo Restrepo, who is at, uh, uh, he's an applied mathematician at uh, one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany. Um, he, he and I have been studying um, the Nobel, the history of the, of the Nobel Prize in chemistry for the last couple of years. And this initiated in large measure to what we chemists know, um, and that is over the last decades, more and more of the Nobel Prizes in chemistry have been to honor achievements in the life sciences and the molecular sciences, not in pure chemistry. And Guillermo and I wanted to investigate that a little further. And what we did in part was the data we used was bio analysis of biographical and citation information. That is, we analyzed, we first identified with the help of the lectures provided by the Nobel Prize laureates themselves, the key, their key publications that led to their Nobel Prizes, and then analyzed the journals in which publications appeared that cited those publications, those Nobel, key Nobel Prize publications. So we're analyzing the publications in the literature that cite these Nobel Prize publications. And we also analyze the publications in those Nobel Prize publications to see what journals they appeared in. And we were able to distinguish between chemistry journals that are cited or were being cited and life science journals. But in order, of course, to do that, you have to know enough about the sociology of, the, of chemistry and the life sciences to distinguish journals from each other. We also asked the question, to what extent are the major disciplines of the Nobel Committee, Nobel Committee for Chemistry's members. So we wanted to see if the membership of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry, the group that selects the Nobel Prizes, whether that membership is reflective of the increasing number of Nobel Prizes in the life sciences which meant that we needed to first identify who the members were and then identify what their fields of expertise is. And this is an excerpt from, from that paper, one of the, one of the major 
tables from that paper and you can see in the red are the are the members who are essentially bio oriented life science people and the rather strong correlation between the composition of the membership in the Nobel Committee for Chemistry and the percent of Nobel Prizes in the life sciences. So analyze, so this is essentially not analyzing chemistry data, but analyzing the data that relates to the chemistry data. So it's meta, 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 meta science. I wanted to show a story about how one seemingly tangential publication resolves or helps resolve a, a, a mystery in history of chemistry. So one, one literature, primary literature publication changes, changes the story completely. And this is on the total synthesis of quinine. In 1944-45, Woodward on the left and During on the right uh, published the first total synthesis of quinine. Quinine was important at that time, 1940s, because it's the major natural anti-malarial and um, more American troops died of malaria in the South Pacific than were killed by enemy fire. And so they, they Woodward and Doring published their paper in 44, and it was picked up by Life magazine and, and many other newspapers and radio, and it was a big, it was a big deal. And as of the year 2000, well, even now, that synthesis wa was Woodward's first total synthesis. And it was a type of a chemical achievement that was classical, that is classical in terms of total synthesis of natural products. So status of, of 2000, Merck index, I mean, it's a major achievement in organic chemistry. And then in 2000, Gilbert Stork, pictured here, who um, died just a few years ago, uh, not, not a Nobel laureate, but certainly could have and should have been um, a major uh, synthetic organic chemist, wrote to Chemical Engineering News, that's a news magazine of the American Chemical Society, that Woodward Enduring Synthesis was a myth. And that was repeated in CNA News a few more times. And Stork claimed that it was a quasi-universal impression of a synthesis in a JAX paper, JCS paper, that he published in 2001 on his total synthesis of quinine. The then editor-in-chief of Chemical Engineering News, Madeline Jacobs, wrote an editorial entitled Setting the Record Straight, stating that, that Woodward Enduring Synthesis was indeed a myth. Now, what, what was that all about? So here's an excerpt from Woodward Enduring's um, full paper, the very last sentence of that full paper. In view of the established conversion of quinotoxin to quinine, with the synthesis of quinotoxin, the total synthesis of quinine was complete. So what Woodward and Doring are saying is they are reporting the synthesis of quinotoxin and not quinine, but other people had synthesized quinine from quinotoxin. Let me, let me explain that. In, in the 1860s, Pasteur was trying to determine the structure of quinine. And so he took quinine and heated it with acid, sulfuric acid, I believe, and was able to isolate a crystalline material, which was named quinotoxin. But the structure of quinine quinotoxin, those structures were not determined until the early 1900s. Rabba, um, Paul Rabba uh, established the structure of quinine in 1908. Rabba and Kindler, Kindler was then his graduate student, took quinotoxin and in several steps converted it into quinine. The picture of Carl Kindler, the only one I could find, is of course him many, many years later. So Woodward and Doring were relying 
on, if you see on the very bottom of this slide, they were relying on the conversion of two to one quinotoxin to quinine by Rabin and Kindler in their total synthesis. Woodward and Enduring took on the top left inexpensive commercially available starting material, an isoquinoline, and converted it in a number of steps to optically pure D quinotoxin. And then they said, based on rabid kinlu, we now claim the total synthesis of quinine. And that's called a formal total synthesis. And you go back to 1918 and look at the rabbit and Kindler publication. And it turns out that it was one page in total, two half pages, actually. They didn't report the experimental details meaning there was no experimental section, nor was one ever published later. What they gave were the reagent solvents and the melting points of the quinine and so on, but essentially very little details. So what, what, what uh, Gilbert Stork was saying was because there's no experimental details, we cannot rely on this 1918 paper and if Rabin Kindler didn't do it, and Woodward and Doring never tried to reproduce Rabbit and Kindler, in fact, no one had, the claim of a total synthesis cannot be made. All you can claim is the total synthesis of quinotoxin, which turned out later to be a natural product, but not quinine. And that's the basis of the claims of myth and the chemical and engineering news editorial. However, ah, and I should say, that's also a claim. Stork didn't recognize this, but he was essentially saying you can't rely on Rabin and Kindler. Um, Rabin and Kindler were either wrong or they were misrepresenting the science. It was fabrication or falsification. In 1939, Rabin and Kindler published another paper. Now, by this time, Kindler was a professor of medicinal chemistry at another major university in, in Germany. But Rabbe writes in that 1939 paper, 21 years later, we had preserved, he really means I had preserved, the leftover residues of the various reduction experiments of the past. In other words, in his cabinet, on a shelf were all of Kindler's original residues from his reactions 21 years later. And what, what Rabin then reports is the above leftover mixture of bases when treated in this way and crystallized in that way, from this in the usual way, the still present quinine was removed 3.3 grams. So 21 years later, Rabbe in his own hands takes material from 1918 and extracts out and crystallizes quinine from it. Now, why would Rabbe do that in 1939? Let me tell you why. By 1939, it was known that quinine existed or could exist with three diastereomers which are shown at the very top. Diastereomers are isomers which differ only by the stereochemistry of the substituents in the molecule. So you can see that quinine and epiquinine differ only by the position of the hydrogen and the hydroxyl. And quinidine and epiquinidine have the same distinction, the hydroxyl and the hydrogen, but the um, quinoline ring is up instead of down relative to the bicyclo 222 system. Okay, by 1939, chemists understood there were these four compounds. These are four diastereomers. They understood what their melting points were, and in one case, only in oil, and they were well characterized. And what, what, what Rabbe wanted to know is, in the last step, did, did um, Himmler actually obtain all four? So Rabbe wasn't interested really in recovering quinine. He was interested in seeing and demonstrating that there was epiquinine quinidine and, and epiquinidine in that 
reaction mixture from 21 years later. So that one, that one publication, 1939, is, is either rather would lie again 21 years later, or it is proof that quinine was in fact made by, by Kindler and therefore the legitimacy of the Woodward during claim. Most wonderfully, I brought on two different occasions, uh, Bill Doring in 2005, Gilbert Stork in 2010, to look at the quinine papers and the documents. Um, and that's a wonderful story in its own right. Um, wonderful experience for me to have with these, with these, with these people. Okay, I'm drawing to the end of my my different examples. Um, I want to go back to data from my own personal experience. In 1966, 65, 67, as an undergraduate, I was doing research in steroid chemistry and uh, cholesterol um, uh, related to cholesterol. It's a dihydrocholesterol oxidized hydroxy group to the keto. I was working on steroids. And, and um, you know, as an undergraduate, you look at structures like that and you go, what is that all about? But um, they became uh, close family uh, members to me from my years as an undergraduate. So I love steroid chemistry. And recently, um, for reasons, most interesting reasons, well, I can even say quickly, in Mexico City, outside the major museum of anthropology, Mexico City, one of the world's greatest museums, is a, I don't know, 40 foot, 60 foot sculpture of, um, of one of the Inca gods. And on, the, on his upper left eyebrow, the letters M.A. for Russell Marker appear. And that's an interesting story in a paper that will be published next month of mine in um, the Journal of the Chemical Record. I, I, I got interested in Russell Marker. Um, and on the bottom, uh, the Marker's upper right, uh, A.J. Bose was my professor as an undergraduate at Stevens Tech um, who had interest in steroid chemistry. Okay. Um, so I published a paper on Russell Marker. Marker and essentially initiated the steroid pharmaceutical industry by finding plant sources of steroids in Mexico. He's not very well known today. Names like Carl Gerasi and in fact, Percy Julian are key, key figures in that. But Russell Mark was actually the beginning person of that. And from uh, one, one set of his papers, I've extracted many, many of his key reactions. Diastgenin is the plant, one of the plant steroids um, that that marker was able to uh, obtain from, from these Mexican yams, and he converted it to cholesterol as well as progesterone and, and many other uh, commercially important uh, 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 steroids and steroid hormones too, not cholesterol, of course, that was just uh, an academic exercise. Um, so I guess my point is I was able to understand Marker's chemistry because of my own experimental work. So one advantage of being a chemist doing history of chemistry is sometimes what goes around comes around, you come back to your own childhood, your own childhood. Okay, the last example, the last case that I wish to make, and I'm, I'm really pleased that I've done this in 45 minutes. Um, maybe you are too. <laughs> Anyhow, um, it struck me interesting um, for this last case. When studying a controversial subject, collaborate. If possible, collaborate with the other side. Um, not the dark side, the equal side, the other side, because the combined data is richer and more informative than either one set alone. 
And, and I'm really proud of the next slide. Um, and Peter, there you are. Uh, this is Peter uh, receiving what's now called the HIST Award, was then the Edelstein Award for Lifetime Achievement in History of Chemistry. I'm on the far left. I was chair of HIST at that time, and that's Ruth Badish, um, Sidney Edelstein's daughter. Anyhow, uh, Peter and I published a paper last year on the occasion of the centennial of the Division of History of Chemistry, which Gary Patterson, his historian, is putting together a series of publications that, that talk about his centennial. In, in, and I'm sure th these will be published um, on the HIST website is, and perhaps some in, in the Bulletin for the History of Chemistry. Anyhow, Peter and I um, discussed the importance of plurality and mutual respect in the practice of the history of chemistry. What we're referring to here is that chemists who do history of chemistry, some people call those chemist historians, or, and historians, such as, of course, Alan Rock, one of my heroes, and Peter Morris do history of chemistry and they're historians. We all share the same stories, but we also share the same chemistry, the same molecules, the same reactions, the same properties. And there is a real need to be respectful and appreciative of the work of each other. And that's not always the case. And this paper of Peter's and mine talks about this relationship and how it's deep and, and, and has a much greater opportunity in the future for collaborative work. So, um, Hasek Chang, Hasek Chang said that chemistry needs history and philosophy of chemistry. And today I'm saying maybe preaching to the choir because most of you are chemists, but history and philosophy of chemistry need chemistry and need us, need chemists as well. So thank you, Peter, for the opportunity to uh, uh, give this talk and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... We've got a few comments here, mainly from Henry Rep, uh, as you might suspect. Uh, I'll read out um, Henry's comments, uh, mainly from Henry, I think they're all from Henry, except from one by me. His first comment is, Hydra, re acid base theory. Frank Weinhold, or Weinhold, depending on how you pronounce it, has promoted this concept very elegantly over the last 40 years or so, NBO theory. Oh yes, yes. Henry is the Henry's the expert. And one of my I, I had a set of goals as the people I wanted to collaborate with. You know, Peter, you were one of them, so that's sort of my bucket list with you. But I've always wanted to collaborate with Henry too. Um I've tried a few times. We almost did once, and maybe this time in the future. So thank you, Henry. Okay, another comment from Henry coming up. Um Jeff, Fouquet, Fouquet equation is now credited to Krupman and Salam, and indeed now widely taught, or used to be. Probably a number of people obtained the same equation, but eventually stuck to one pair. So, so I think Henry's saying um, or commenting about the accuracy. Oh, maybe I should stop sharing. Let me let me do this, and you. I, I, you, you can almost, can you see me? I don't know. Um, Henry's, I'm going to generalize from Henry's comment. Um, Robert Merton pointed out, and it's now called, I think, the Stiegler hypothesis, uh, the Stiegler theory, that the people for whom something is named are never the people who deserve being credited for um, that finding. I don't think that's always true. But um, one, again, needs to look at the data. When you know, Woodward Hoffman rules really maybe should be the Ostaf Fukui Woodward Hoffman rules. And, and Peter's quite right with regard to the homo lumo um, 
uh, and, and, and uh, naming uh, as well. The, the Salem, uh, Salem deserves more credit. Koopman, yeah, deserves more credit. I agree with, I agree with Henry. I think you said Peter when I think you meant Henry, but we'll let that pass. Uh, oh, were uh, we talking about Henry Rizepa? Was it Henry Rizepa? Henry, Henry made the comment, yeah. Okay. So they're all from Henry at the moment. I've got my own question at the end, but this is all from Henry. Well, Henry, only one gets, from Henry. Henry only gets... One of the problems in understanding historical context is terminology. Thus, the term radical, as you, for example, in 1880, has evolved very considerably over the last decade. Translations also matter. For example, from German, as written by Mirwan, or Mirwan, regarding Cabo, Cabo, I can't pronounce it. Carbo Catanite. Uh, Carbo Yeah, sorry. It's a bit, it's a bit tongue tied though. <laughs> so, so, so I, I agree. Um, I, I recently published a paper in Foundations of Chemistry where I try to define the meaning of revolutions in science. Peter has edited a book on revolutions in chemistry and written two or three of the chapters in that, in which there's no definition of revolutions in chemistry. And I've had some debates with Roel Hoffman about the value of definitions. Roel doesn't like definitions because he believes they are limiting. But if we don't have a, an agreement on the meaning of the words we use with other people, how can we communicate effectively? So um, it's, it's an interesting situation when people use words without defining them. Okay, now to hit a quick, Jeff, here's my question. Okay. It's not an original question, but I asked it. Why did Woodward and Doering not carry out the final step so they had quinine in their hand? I, I, I know the answer to that. And I know uh, there's only one way to know the answer to that question, and that is to ask them, to ask them. And, mm -hmm. and of course, I couldn't ask Woodward, but I did ask Doring. And I asked him that several times over several years. And the answer is, they trusted Rabba. Right. Rabba was a premier alkaloid chemist. He spent almost his entire career in the field of quinine chemistry, meaning, as I said, he determined the structure of quinine in 1908 and was still doing it in, in the 1940s. And they trusted him. Now, somebody might say, and I said this to Doring, well, what would have happened if you tried to reproduce it and couldn't? And there was a point at which, it's a long story, not for today, you can read that in my Agravante Kami article, but um, Gilbert Stork, the same Gilbert Stork yeah, we've been talking about, wrote to Woodward 1944 asking that question. Woodward never responded. If Woodward and Doring, if Doring was the experimentalist, tried and couldn't succeed, then Woodward and Doring couldn't have made that claim. So it's the question of doing one experiment too many. I don't, I, I don't know to what extent Woodward, who was leading that project, worried about that, but I suspect he did. Okay. But there's also the psychological aspect, though, isn't there? I mean, there's not just the sort of what you might call chemical legalistic aspect oh, of it. Let, oh, Peter, let me go. It's regarded as legitimate to stop at the point where somebody else has completed the process. Well, but I'm people, also talking about the psychological aspect. Wouldn't well, they have felt psychologically more happy if they had Queen in than that? So there's the psychological aspect of it. Let, uh, let, me, let me add to that, and I'm sorry I didn't. My article in Ankavanti Kemi in 2007, which discussed the historical part, 
encouraged a number of experimental chemists to consider repeating Rabbit and Kindler's work. And Bob Williams, who was one of Woodward's last PhD graduate students at Colorado State, and his graduate student, Aaron, Aaron Smith, did repeat Rabbit and Kindler's work, and they were able to do so. Not only that, but Woodward was probably psychologically burned by that experiment, by, by that failure of his, and he always remembered it, because when he and Eschenmoser completed the total synthesis of vitamin B12, they, their initial report was also a formal total synthesis. They, they only made cobrinic acid. And ger some German chemist named Fischer had previously reported the transformation of cobrinic acid to vitamin B12. So Woodward said, well, we've made cobrinic acid, so we don't have to do that. But he didn't. He actually took vitamin B12, degraded the cobrinic acid, and then reconverted it back to vitamin B12. But that wasn't enough for Woodward. He had one of his graduate students remake totally synthetic cobrinic acid and then convert the totally synthetic cobrinic acid to vitamin B12. And Escher Moses thought that was absolutely crazy, but, but that's what Woodward did. So that 20 years later, he was reflecting on, we don't know this for sure, and I've asked that student, um, why did, did Wood, was Woodward thinking about quinine when he, when he had you do that a year's worth of work? And the student said, um, he, they wondered about that, but they did not have the courage to ask Woodward. Uh -huh. They felt uh -huh. it would be impertinent. Yeah. Okay, one final question, Jeff. Can you hear me, Jeff? One yes, final I can. Question. Yes. So it come from Hazel. Um, how did you go about finding the paper that you were talking about? Did you have any challenges when trying to identify the paper? I don't know that. Um, you know, doing, doing research in the history of chemistry is no different than doing research in chemistry. You need to know the literature. And today it's much easier because it's all computerized and most of it's computerized. So you can go online and call up any journal and get download PDFs trivially, but, but it's no different. Um, I just started reading, for example, all of Rabbi's publications on quinine. And that's how I came across that particular paper. It's just hard work. And if you're not a chemist, it's rather daunting. And I remember picking up the Russell Marker papers and going back to 1960s in my life and, and, and chuckling and thinking how easy it is for me to look at these structures because I did it before. But it's, it's the hard work of doing research. And the wonderful thing, it's so much fun as a chemist. Gary Patterson makes the comment that literature research requires literature. Go to the science history institute, he says. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, sh I need to thank not only people like Rold. I mean, I, I, Rold has, I've shared, I don't know, more than a thousand emails with Rold and four visits of a week each where I deposed him for days on end. And more recently, over 70 two-hour Zoom conferences going page by page through his laboratory notebooks. I mean, uh, and there have been other people. I've interviewed Albert Eschemoser probably five or six days worth at his home in Zurich. And, um, well, you could see that I had interactions with During and Stork and so on. So in addition to those people, right? Harvard Archives and the um, Science History Institute Archives have been very useful and important to me. So you know, those folks, um, Patrick Shea at, at SHI, for example, really thankful to people like that. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I think we'll stop at that point. That's a very good point to stop.
Uh, firstly, allow me before you disappear and before I close it down to talk about Nick Mum. Because, well, actually, we've got Nick Week first because we're having a talk Nick Week on Islamic Arabic alchemy. And apart from Arabic alchemy being important in itself, it was also very important in terms of the transmission of alchemy. I had a different disappear, but never mind. Uh, uh, very important in terms of um, transmission of alchemy from Byzantium in the 5th century or 6th century through the Islamic period and then into the Christian Middle Ages. So they had an important role in keeping alchemy going. So I do urge you to come to the talk, same time, same place, next week, to hear about Arabic alchemy. And I'm sure it will be a fascinating talk. Now, next month, just very quickly, I'll be talking about Henry and Bill Rocco, because right now I'm racing to get the manuscript of my biography with Rocco with Peter Reed. I'm writing it with Peter Reed, who now lives in California. And um, I'll be talking about Rocco, the famous Manchester chemist. Now, after that, a week later, uh, we'll be having a talk about Greco-Roman alchemy, which is basically really Egyptian alchemy, but in the Greco-Roman culture. And that will be the second last of our talk in the history of chemistry. I'm hoping we'll have some sort of debate about what were the origins of chemistry for the very final meeting, but that hasn't been arranged yet. So please don't go away. Please come back next week. Please come back next month and let's keep this going. Meanwhile, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much, Jeff, for talking. I hope you're still there. I think you are. And have a good afternoon, wherever you are. Bye for now.